morning once again, everybody. Special welcome to our visitors here today. God bless you. Thanks for joining us this morning. Now, we have a picture. Can we go one ahead here? There we go. We are going to get in our time machine again this morning. We're going to travel 3,400 years into the past, and we're with Moses on Mount Sinai receiving instructions for this colossal object lesson we call the tabernacle or the tent of meeting. You remember the tabernacle? We'll have a picture in just a second here of the tabernacle. We're looking inside the tabernacle right now, and we're looking at some of the furniture that was to be in that tabernacle. And remember, each piece of, the, each piece of furniture has significance. In one way, shape, or form, everything about that tabernacle in the wilderness is going to point us to Jesus Christ. Why? Because Jesus Christ, Son of God, Son of Man, is the only bridge between fallen men and a holy God. And this tabernacle was an object lesson. The tabernacle was the one place where God would meet with man. And it was to be done on God's terms. There is no covering of sin unless there's bloodshed. The wages of sin is death. Remember that? And through one man, sin entered the world, and death by sin, and so death has passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. And God was going to make sure we understood that. So he told Moses, you build this tabernacle. We're going to illustrate these things. Okay? Now, in the last chapter, in chapter 29, uh, we were talking about the priesthood that would minister in the tabernacle, a special priestly class within Israel. Why a special class of priests? Well, God wanted a whole kingdom of priests. Israel said, we don't want to hear God face to face. We don't want to hear his voice directly. Moses, you intercede. And God said, all right, we will make a priesthood. I will call a special class. And there was significance to that too, right? God will call whom he will. And it turned out that Moses' brother Aaron was to be the high priest, and his sons were to make up the priestly class in Israel. Uh, and in chapter 29 of the book of Exodus, uh, we read about the consecration of those priests. Special sacrifices made for those priests. Special garments to be worn. Uh, everything to be just as God ordains, because everything is an object lesson pointing to the person, work, ministry of Jesus. And there are many fine commentaries that talk about this. If you want to go into it uh, in much more detail. But um, look at verse 21. Exodus 29, 21. It's kind of gruesome, but sin is gruesome. And the death that results because of sin is gruesome. Let's face it. And Christ's death on the cross to pay our sin debt was gruesome. It's ghastly. And the Bible says we are to look at this full in the face and realize how horrendous sin really, really is. What the, what the penalty for sin is. What it took to secure our forgiveness and redemption. Christ on the cross. And so that's why the Old Testament is dripping in blood. Blood sacrifices pointing to Jesus, the one who would be the ultimate sacrifice, the ultimate worthy being, sacrificing himself for the sins of the world. In Exodus 29, 21, Moses is instructed, you shall take some of the blood that is on the altar and some of the anointing oil and sprinkle it on Aaron and on his garments, on his sons and on the garments of his sons with him, and he and his garments shall be hallowed, and his sons and his sons' garments with him. And we said, you know, as you track this in the scriptures, the shed blood of these animals always points to the shed blood of Jesus, the sacrifice that would end all sacrifices. We don't kill lambs and rams and bulls and goats and all that other stuff. We don't do that. Because those things could never take away sin. We needed a sinless man to come who also was ultimately worthy. We needed Jesus Christ, the God-man. We needed someone to come into the world to represent man to God and God to man. We needed someone who could be 100% God, not half God, 100% God, and yet could be 100% man. One person with two natures. We needed that. That's why Jesus came into the world, to, to save sinners. And don't you feel like you're the chief of sinners some days? He came into the world to seek and save the lost. And he paid your sin debt and mine with his own blood on the cross. Every animal that lost its life in sacrifice 
and had its blood shed in that tabernacle and later on in the temple was a shadow, a type, an arrow pointing to Jesus. But what's this anointing oil? They were to be sprinkled with oil too. Well, here we realize as we track it through Scripture that the anointing oil always points to the person, work, ministry of the Holy Spirit of God. Remember our God, one being, one eternal divine being, and yet three persons, three persons equally divine from all eternity in love relationship, in community. Our God is triune, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, each assuming roles necessary to secure the redemption and the salvation of people, human beings. And so Aaron and the priestly class were to be sprinkled with the blood and the anointing oil. Redemption, justification, symbolized in the blood. And what? Symbolized by the oil. The work of the Holy Spirit, the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. We want to talk about that this morning. When you come to Jesus as a lost sinner, you say, Jesus, I can't save myself. I am guilty. I've broken your wise laws. I need you to forgive me. I accept that you died on the cross for me. I believe it. I accept it. You do that. In your own words, you do that. You believe that. And he'll save you on the spot. And he'll never let you go. He will walk with you every day of your life. He'll secure a home in heaven for you. That's called saving faith. It's not that your faith is some kind of mystical power. It's not that your faith really amounts to too much. It's just that God has chosen to respond to that faith. See, that's how great our God is. You exercise saving faith, and he'll save you forever. But that's not the end of the story, friends. That's the beginning You exercise saving faith, and you're saved by what Jesus did. But guess what? Now you must exercise faithfulness. Not to to be saved, not to stay saved, but to please the one that saved you and me. Does that make sense? There's saving faith, and then there's faithfulness. And this faithfulness that we're striving for to get better at, that's called sanctification. And that's the work of the Holy Spirit in your life and in mine. It makes you better than you were yesterday. Maybe you trust God a little more today than you did yesterday. Maybe you're better today at following his commandments than you were yesterday. That's the sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit. In verse 32, look at that, Exodus 29, 32, Aaron and his sons were to eat the ram of consecration, the sacrificial ram. They were to eat this thing. Uh, And it says they're to eat the bread that was offered in the basket. Verse 33, they shall eat those things with which the atonement was made to consecrate and sanctify them, but an outsider shall not eat them because they are holy. And here we realize that that special priestly class had special privileges. And uh, a special privilege there to eat of the animal that was shed to atone for their sin, to cover their sin, temporarily cover cover their sin. Because this thing is going to be offered and re-offered, these blood sacrifices. And of course, you don't have to look very far or very long before you realize there is an amazing parallel between those priests eating the animal that was slain for them and us partaking of the Lord's Supper. We do it monthly in this church. We break the bread we sh- and we drink from the fruit of the vine. And we remember the Lord's broken body and shed blood. Now, of course, we don't believe in anything like transubstantiation around here. We do not believe that we're actually eating the actual blood and body of Jesus. We just simply don't believe that. Okay, those are symbols. And Christ in his wisdom has so ordained that we are to partake of those elements and remember him in a special way. Because he knows how feeble we are and how feeble our memories are and how easily distracted we can be. And so he has ordained that there, look, there's going to be certain things you're going to do so that I'm ever before your eyes. And the Lord's Supper is one of those things. But you can see a shadow and type right here uh, amongst the priestly class here. An obvious parallel. Okay. Now the remainder of chapter 29 uh, is a series of sacrifices, other sacrifices, additional rituals that need to be uh, enacted to get these priests functioning as a, as a legitimate priesthood. Okay. But uh, let's go now into verse... Uh, or rather chapter 30. Let's look at chapter 30 together, okay? Let's read those first three verses. Chapter 30. You shall make an altar to burn incense 
You shall make it of acacia wood. A cubit shall be its length, and a cubit its width, and it shall be square. Two cubits shall be its height. Its horn shall be one uh, piece with it. And you shall overlay its top, its sides with all around, and its horns with pure gold. And you shall make for it a molding of gold all around. In verse 6, it says, You shall put it before the veil that is before the ark of the testimony, before the mercy seat that is over the testimony, where I will meet with you. Okay, so what are we talking about here? Here is that altar of incense he's talking about. It's kind of a square looking thing. And incense is burnt on there, offered up. Okay? And that thing is put right here in the tabernacle, right outside the veil. This veil's open in our picture so we can see the, the Ark of the Covenant. This is where the Lord meets with the high priest once a year in a very spectacular and special way. On the day of Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, the priest gets to go into this chamber right here and he meets with God above the mercy seat. There's God, his presence. And if he doesn't do everything that God prescribed, he's dead. And God is sort of giving us a fantastically serious and impressive object lesson. We approach a holy God on his terms and on his terms only. Jesus has made the way now to himself. Jesus has opened the way to God. But we must never presume into God's presence uh, as though we can do so on our own merits. Oh, I'm better than my neighbor. I can just walk into God's presence anytime on my own merits, on my own goodness, my own righteousness. No. And this is an object lesson right here. Once a year, the priest comes into the presence of God in a very, very uh, spectacular way God is manifest there. And you remember that when Jesus died on that cross, what happened to the veil? Ripped from the top to the bottom. It wasn't just kind of rolled up either, right? Because you could just put the thing back. It was ripped in two. Don't put it back. The way is open now into the presence of God through what? Through faith in Jesus. You put your faith in Christ, his finished work, what he did for you. And you have bold access to the throne of God. Not because we're that good, but because he's that generous. And those priests there ministering at the time when Jesus was crucified, they would have looked in horror into the holiest of holies. And they would have thought, oh no, the barrier's gone between a sinful man and a holy God. We're dead. And when they didn't die, they started thinking, you know what? This might be an invitation. Something new has happened. And Peter preached that. Do you remember? Fifty days later on the day of Pentecost, Peter preached it. And thousands of priests were saved. The incense that's offered up on that altar, you tracked us through the scriptures. Psalm 141 is a good place to go. The incense that's going up represents the prayers of the saints. It also represents Christ's prayer ministry for you and me. Jesus Christ the Lord ascended now and seated at the right hand of God the Father, making intercession for you and me. Satan comes into our lives and he tempts us to sin against God. And when you trip and you fall and you do, guess what Satan's doing? He's there accusing you. That's Revelation 12. He's the great accuser of the brethren. Oh, but guess who stands at the right hand of God the Father? Jesus Christ, the advocate. The Lord Jesus, the righteous one. And he says, no, that one's not guilty. I, I paid his sin debt with my own blood. How's that? You have the greatest advocate you could ever have in the third heaven at the right hand of God. And that altar of incense represents the prayer ministry of Jesus. It represents our prayers, too, the prayers of the saints. And you know, it's very funny because I want to talk today about the the golden or the, uh, the brazen laver situated outside the tabernacle. I really want to talk about that today because that speaks of washing and sanctification and regeneration. And I plan this big message around sanctification and we want to get there, but this morning God says, you need to talk about prayer. I wanted to kind of jump over that altar of incense. And I think God would have me say at least a few words about prayer. Okay, so here goes. Friends, if you're a Christian... You can't do without it. It's our connection to God. We must, be, we must be a praying church. I thank God that as time goes on, we're becoming more and more a praying church. I didn't lie to Dr. Kawaza. We are a praying church, but we need to be more and more a praying church. Jesus Christ was and is the most beautiful, spotless, 
wonderful, wise human being to ever walk the face of this planet. And during his earthly ministry, guess what he was? A man of prayer. Before he called his 12 apostles, you know what he did? He spent the night in prayer, praying, praying. He didn't think he could do without it. We can't do without it. We need to be in prayer. And there's so much to be said about prayer. Uh, God instructs us to pray. Pray without ceasing. Pray in all things. He didn't say give thanks for all things. I mean, friends, we were in prayer for this young man, Cooper, who was just found dead. Are we to th thank you, God, this man was found dead. No, I don't think so. Thank you for murderers in the world. No, I don't think so. You know what we thank? We thank God that even though wicked things happen on this earth, we say, thank you, God, you are so great, you can even take the wicked things that men do and you can work them together for a purpose of a greater good. I don't know how you're able to do that, Lord, but I trust you, you are. When you pray, you know what you're doing? When you're, I mean, when you're actually praying as a Christian now. Okay, we're not talking about the health and wealth prosperity heretics. We're not talking about those guys. We're talking about legitimate Christian prayer. When, when you're praying, you know what you're doing? You're confessing. You're confessing what? That you're limited. You're finite. You're fallen. You really don't know a whole lot. You're really not that strong. Right? And I'm, I'm speaking first person here too, right? I mean, that's what I'm confessing when I pray. When I say, God, I need your help here. I think I'm at the end of my own strength, which I don't have to go too far to reach. <laughs> say, Lord, I just don't know very much. Can you please help me? Just as an example, I mean, I've got a debate coming up. I have a computer savvy opponent with the internet at her, at her disposal. What do I have? Dusty old books. <laughs> Say, Lord, I just don't know too much. Oh, thank you, Lord. In Christ are deposited all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Thank you, Jesus. You really are the answer. I was out for a prayer walk this morning, and he reminded me that I would have nothing... And I mean nothing. No, I wouldn't have any knowledge at all that I could call knowledge if God didn't talk to me in his word. If he didn't tell me who he really was, and he didn't, if he didn't tell me that he was love, what could I really say that I knew? I feel sorry for people out there that they say they're not atheists, they're just spiritual. That's very popular today. I'm spiritual. I believe in a greater power. I believe in some shadowy, ill-defined deity that doesn't talk to me. Well, that's fine. What do I really know now? If this, de if this deity hasn't talked to me, what do I know? What is my own opinion and what is revelation? What can I call infallible knowledge? Nothing, friends, nothing. I'm lost in a sea of human opinion. But our God isn't like that. In Jeremiah 9, 23, the, the prophet speaks for God. And he says, let him that glory, glory in this, that he, glory in this, that he knows and understands me. See, God speaks to us. He tells us things. There's content to the Christian message. God says, I'm the greatest conceivable being. When I want to swear, I'll swear by none greater than myself. Thank you. When I want to confirm something with an oath, I will swear by myself. That's what God says. And God says, I'm love. And when I tell you something, I don't lie to you. I tell you the truth. See, if I believe in a being like that, now I can know some things. Because this being doesn't mess with me or lie to me. He doesn't lie to you either. Does that make sense? And when you pray, friends, to that God, you're confessing, God, I agree with you. I really don't know anything apart from you and what you've told me. Thank you for interpreting the world for me. Thank you for showing me who I really am. Thank you for showing me the solution to my greatest needs. That's what prayer is. It's confession. It's a reminder it's a reminder to be humble before God. You know, that's what prayer is. And Jesus said, pray often. Be in connection to your Heavenly Father. Pray without ceasing. Jesus gave us a, a number of parables about prayer, didn't he? Matthew 11, Matthew 18. He said, remember this unjust judge sitting there, being pestered by this widow who is being victimized? And the judge says, I really don't care much about this widow but she keeps coming to me, I think I'll finally help her out. And Jesus says, in effect, look at that unjust judge, so unlike God, who actually cares for you. If he is going to actually do something for the widow, I think God is going to do something for you. And he may not answer your prayer the way you want. It's because he knows better. 
He knows what you really need. And sometimes he doesn't give us what we ask for. Why? Well, James tells you. Because sometimes we ask amiss, and we want to spend it on our own lusts. And God says, don't, don't ask for that, those things. I'm not giving it to you. You'll misuse it. Sometimes we ask for things, we really think we need them. Lord, if you just give me this thing, I really need this thing. God says, in effect, I'm not giving it to you. It'll blow up in your face. You don't know how to handle this. Maybe we don't see that, but we must trust our God. He knows me better than I know myself. Is that your story too? Does God know you better than you know yourself? I think so. Our motives matter in our prayers. James says you have not because you ask not. And you ask and you don't receive because you ask amiss. Prayer is a great corrector. It reminds us that we really need God. It reminds us to ask for the things that will honor him and genuinely help others. We're to be praying for others. James says it, James 5, 16. Pray one for another that you may be healed. Confess your faults one to another. I like when we get together for prayer on, on Wednesday evenings. We, we, some, we often split. Men and women will split. It's not that that's a rule, a hard, fast rule, but sometimes men want to talk about things that they don't want the ladies to hear and vice versa. And we can pray one for another that we may be healed. All right. Let's move ahead here to, chap to uh, verse... Uh, Let's go to 17. And we can flip ahead one slide there, okay? There we go. Verse 17, we're going to talk about this thing called the laver. This big metal pot that holds water. And I want you to notice its situation here. There is the big tabernacle court. There is the altar of sacrifice where you offer the burnt offering. There is the big laver there, the big metal pot that holds the water, and there's the tabernacle proper. And the priest offers sacrifice, he washes in the laver, then he goes and ministers in the tabernacle. So let's read about it, verse 17. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, You shall also make a laver of bronze with its base also of bronze for washing. You shall put it between the tabernacle of meeting and the altar. You shall put water in it, for Aaron and his sons shall wash their hands and their feet uh, in the water from it. They shall go into the tabernacle of meeting, or when they come near the altar to minister, to burn an offering made by fire to the Lord, they shall wash with water lest they die. You say, Lord, that's kind of harsh. <laughs> I need to wash every time in, before I minister, I need to wash in that water, or you're going to kill me? Yes. These are shadows and types of the person, work, and ministry of Jesus. And this is infinitely serious business. Look at that situation again. Blood atonement made first. Then the washing, then the ministering. This is a picture of the Christian life right here. Don't ever forget it, friends. You're not going to do any ministering for Jesus. You're not going to do anything of spiritual significance that echoes in eternity. Not one thing unless you first come to the cross. And that's what the Bible says. Okay, apart from Jesus, you can do what? Nothing. Paul says, but I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You've got to come to him first, on his terms, the cross. And then you wash. Sanctification. This thing called sanctification. This thing called faithfulness. And then you minister. And we want to talk about that. Because that water... This is very difficult, friends, but this water means something. It speaks of your new birth as a new creature in Jesus. And it speaks of the daily washing from sins that we commit as we walk through this life. It speaks of many things. And we want to talk about how that works in your life and in mine. I want to say right now that there is an unbreakable connection here. It's very difficult to even understand it. But we're going to try under God here this morning. There is an unbreakable connection between the regenerating and sanctifying work of the Holy Spirit and the word through which he ministers. Water, the water there in that laver is a shadow and type not only of the word of God, but of the Holy Spirit who ministers to you through the word. Nobody but nobody gets saved on this planet unless he accepts what the word says. That's difficult, isn't it? You need the gospel 
You need the content of preaching. You need to hear that and believe it. And who ministers that word to you? Who makes that word alive to you? Who penetrates a hard heart? The Holy Spirit. You see, how does a man get saved? He hears this message, and it's made alive to him by the Spirit of God. And the Spirit penetrates that heart and that mind. You remember in John, the third chapter, Jesus had a little visit one, one evening. Well, and who came to visit him? Do you remember? Nicodemus, the teacher of the Jews. And Jesus said, and Nicodemus, it's kind of very, it's so funny, right? Nicodemus comes, Jesus, you're so great. We know that you're a preacher from God. No one can do these wonderful things you're doing. And Jesus says, in effect, whatever, Nicodemus. <laughs> you must be born again. Just cut right through it. You need to be born again, Nicodemus. And Nicodemus doesn't understand. He said, can I go into my mother's womb and be born again? And Jesus says, are you a teacher in Israel and you don't know about the new birth? Have you never read the prophet Ezekiel, chapter 11, where the prophet says, God will one day remove that stony heart from your flesh and put in you a new spirit, a heart of flesh, the new birth. It's there in the Old Testament. Jesus says that which is Born of flesh is flesh, but that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Jesus says you must be born of water and spirit. Now that's a very troubling word. What does it mean there? Jesus said water and spirit. You must be born of both. And as I analyze the scriptures, he's talking about the Word and the Holy Spirit who ministers that Word to you. Jesus said in John 6.63, this is in your bulletin, the flesh profits nothing, said Jesus. It's the word that I speak to you. They, those words are spirit in their life. You need to believe that message, that God-inspired message. You remember when all his disciples left him? Jesus is left standing there. 5,000 men, women, and children all just depart because he taught a hard teaching. And who's left? Twelve disciples standing around him. And Jesus says, are you, do you want to go too? you want to leave me alone? And Peter says, Lord, where will we go? You have the words of eternal life. Very good, Peter. You got it right. If we didn't have the word of Jesus, what would we have? The conflicting, fallible opinions of men. And how would you ever adjudicate between them? What standard could you possibly apply? Peter, thank you. A flash of genius that didn't come from you, I'm sure, right? Ephesians 5.26, Paul's described, we read this a couple Sundays ago, Paul's describing the fact that Jesus died for the church. Listen to what Paul says, that he might sanctify and cleanse her with a washing of water by the word. And Jesus told his disciples in John 15, you're now clean through the word that I spoke to you. That word symbolized in the water. The water symbolizing the Holy Spirit who ministers to us that word. The Spirit makes alive. In Titus 3, 5, Paul says that we were regenerated, washed by the waters of regeneration, renewing of the Holy Spirit. So water is an appropriate symbol for the Spirit-ministered word of God. Water is life-sustaining. You need it. You can't do without it, can you? You and I need water to live just like we need God's word to live. We need the Spirit of God to illuminate it, illuminate it for us, make it understandable, minister to it to our hearts and our minds. The other thing about water is it's reflective. Those priests could look into that laver or laver. They could look into that calm water, and guess what they would see staring back at them? Their own reflection. The Word of God is life-sustaining, just like water, but the Word of God is reflective, too. You read the Bible, you can't help but be convicted. I mean, have you ever read the Bible and felt deep conviction fall on you? You say, God, I think I'm just not measuring up. So how many of us have felt that? Come on, <laughs> come on, guys. The Bible's interested in what's going on in here, in this heart of mine. The Bible's not the, all that interested, really, in outward show or outward appearance. You remember when uh, uh, Samuel the prophet was sent to anoint a new king. One of the sons of Jesse would be the king. And 
Jesse's sons all paraded themselves in front of Samuel the prophet, and Samuel's looking at them, and he says, this one here, he must be the king. Oh, look at this one here, he must be. This one's very impressive to look at. And God says, no, it's none of them. And Samuel says, well, Jesse, do you have any other sons? And Jesse says, well, I've got one, the little pipsqueak out there in the field, but you, 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 I can bring him in if you want to see him. And God says, that's the one. And God makes an amazing declaration there. He says, man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. That's what God's really interested in, you know. And you read the Bible and you say, God, I don't measure up. I don't think I can. I can't get into heaven if you're looking at my righteousness. If you're looking at this heart of mine, God says, I've got it covered. I know your problem. And Jesus Christ, my son, will go to the cross for you. He will pay your sin debt in full. And I'll start working on that heart of yours. I'll put something new in that chest. I'll take out that stony heart and put in a heart of flesh. Is your story like mine, friends? Do you remember a time when you weren't a Christian? I remember a time when I wasn't. And he changes everything. He sure changed me. He did something in me. Hebrews 4.12 says that the word of God is living and powerful, sharper than any two-edged sword, even to the dividing of joints and marrow and soul and spirit. It's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. Let the word of God speak to you. Let it convict you. Let it lead you to the Savior. And so there's saving faith that you exercise when you come to the cross. And then there's this thing called faithfulness. The sanctifying work of the Spirit as you walk through life. How can a young man cleanse his way? The psalmist asks, Psalm 119. Answer by taking heed thereunto according to your word. We can't do without the Bible, friends. We can't do without the Holy Spirit who makes the Bible alive to us, ministers that word to our hearts. It's a very mystical kind of thing, isn't it? I can't explain it. No mathematical formula for it. You just read the Bible, and the Holy Spirit explains it to you, and he lets you know where you measure up and where you don't. It's a very mysterious thing. You see, this is what you get when you serve a living God, a God who is not just some kind of mental abstraction, a real Savior who's really alive, who really knows what you're going through, who really hears when you pray. And he talks to you and me in his word, and he impresses truths upon your heart. And Jesus said it, my sheep hear my voice. So friends, we need to be in prayer. We want to hear the voice of the great shepherd. And it's so wonderful when we do. I'll just mention one last thing here, okay? I want to mention two last things. First of all, I'll just mention this very quickly. Cross, washing, ministering. I cannot say what untold damage has been done to the cause of Christ by fakey preachers and fakey ministers who miss this step right here. They live like the devil through the week, selfish as anything, deceptive, wicked, and yet get behind a pulpit and convince thousands of people to throw money at them. Right? You know what I'm talking about. Not just those guys, but lots. If we are not clean, we really shouldn't be ministering. And I mean it. We need to be like Daniel. Remember Daniel? Who's watching Daniel? Oh, just everybody, including his most hateful enemies. And they're going to catch him in something. You open your Bible, you try to tell people about Jesus, speak a word in season, oh, they're watching you. They are just waiting to catch you on something to invalidate your message. And if your life isn't clean, you need to make it clean. Take heed thereunto according to his word. Order your life in accordance with this word right here. And that's a message for all of us. Okay, and I'm not hitting anybody in particular here. I'm not, I don't, I'm not slapping anybody. understand that, right? This is a message for all of us. Me too clean vessels that God can use. Last thing I'll mention is this. Notice this laver. We got a nice picture of it here, but nobody knows how big it was. Why? No dimensions given in the Bible. No, not, 
You don't make it this many cubits big and this many cubits long and this and that. It doesn't tell us how big it is. That is a little hint, friends, a little, a little shadow, a type, a parallel to a very important Bible truth, and it's this. No dimensions on that thing speaks of the unlimited cleansing power of God. I don't care what you've done in this life. The blood of Christ can cover it. I remember ministering downtown, and one man said, I could never become a Christian. Jesus could never forgive me for what I've done. I said, oh, yes, he can. How do I know? Because he said so. The Lord Jesus said it. All manner of sin and blasphemy will be forgiven. Jesus is maximally great, friends, and his blood shed on that cross is sufficient to cover the world's sin debt and infinitely more than that. And when you say that Christ wasn't great enough to cover your sin debt, guess what you're doing? You're placing yourself beyond the saving reach of Jesus. Don't do that. There's no recourse for you if you do that. Trust him. The unlimited cleansing power of Jesus. Confess your sins to him. John 1, 9, you remember? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to do what? To cleanse us of all unrighteousness. To make you something new, something beautiful. An identity that you acquire at, upon salvation, that you keep forever a saved, born-again child of God with a home in heaven. You might not look like it right now, but as you walk through this life and you head down this road called sanctification, you ought to be looking more and more like it. You ought to be a better person than you were yesterday, more forgiving today than you were yesterday, a little more godly today than we were yesterday. Sanctification, the cleansing power of the Holy Spirit. Whew, that's a lot to think about, isn't it? <laughs> How are we doing? Prayer. Friends, we need prayer. I'll offer up a prayer right now, and we will worship the Lord one more time in song. Father God, in the precious name of Jesus Christ the Lord, we thank you so much for your word of truth here. Thank you that your word is a light to our path and a lamp to our feet. And uh, thank you, Lord, that... All truth worth knowing is right here. Help us, dear God, by the power of your Spirit to order our lives in accordance with the things you've written in your sacred library. We confess, Lord, that we are finite, limited, fallen. We make mistakes. Uh, Lord God, we are so in need of you. Our prayers are a constant reminder. Lord, we want to pray unselfishly today. We want to pray for others as well. We pray for our dear brothers and sisters in other parts of the world who don't have the luxuries we enjoy from your hands. We pray for their strength and their encouragement. We pray for a bold witness in the face of opposition. We praise and thank our great God who promises that struggles, trials, tears, and pain will not go on forever. We thank you, Lord, that you will restore the world one day. You will redeem our bodies one day. Our great God will one day be all in all and you will take us safely to the shores of a new heavens and a new earth. Dear God, thank you to a place where righteousness dwells forever. We rejoice and praise you. Rejoice in your truths. Praise you for who you are and the promises you've made. Dear God, be honored in our lives more and more every day. In Jesus' precious name, we pray it all. Amen and amen. All right, God bless you all.